All right. Well, hopefully we, everybody takes a little stretch and get ready for the afternoon conversation. Uh, really appreciate uh, the, uh, my group of uh, panelists and look forward to uh, hopefully a, a lively discussion because I think we definitely have uh, some differing opinions uh, within the group. How and, lively do you want it? Uh, we we want to keep people awake. So all right, all right. <laughs> outstanding. So maybe, uh, Jeff, if I could just ask you to introduce yourself and uh, we'll work our way down. Uh, quick, quick introductions. Sure. So. Um, I'm Jeff Chang, uh, president and co-founder of CBOE Vest, um, uh, specializing in target outcome, defined outcome investing. Hi, uh, Charlie Champagne, uh, head up ETF strategy for Allianz Investment Management. Uh, we offer a suite of buffered outcome ETFs. Uh, Burke Ashenden, director of capital markets at Innovator ETFs, uh, currently the largest issuer of defined outcome ETFs. Bruce Cavanaugh from Pacer ETFs. Uh, we're an issuer. We've been around since 2015. Uh, we have uh, 47 funds now and uh, just about to cross over $25 billion in AUM. And for those that weren't here this morning, uh, I'm Rob Morocco. I'm the global head of ETF listings at Cebo Global Markets. Uh, and our DNA, uh, 50 years ago, uh, we created the first standard listed option contract. And so today, 50 years later, when we see the innovation that's going on with these products and where we're going to discuss a little deeper today, SIBO uh, has been a critical part of those products coming to life from the underlying trade, from the data, all the way through the actual ETF that lists on one of our markets. So maybe, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind, we, we use the term defined outcome, buffered outcome, target outcome, structured product. What, what are we speaking about here, just to set a baseline definition when we speak about defined outcome ETFs? I mean, it really started as far as um, uh, looking at kind of the structure node space. Um, and uh, I actually recall back in, I think it was like 2010, um, my co-founder and I were at a, at a structured product conference. And I think it was Eric Glixman at UBS stood up and was like, whoever could solve the credit risk in structure notes would really change the industry. And um, it was kind of challenge accepted. And uh, it was actually Matt McFarlane at SIBO actually wrote a paper on how to, uh, that you could actually put flex options into a fund. And that kind of inspired us to kind of start, start this space there. Um, and so by utilizing flex, um, we were able to provide kind of the same kind of certainty outcomes that you see in maybe like structure notes and annuities but having with all the benefits of, of kind of what comes with exchange-traded options. I think um, uh, what's interesting to us, it was actually, uh, I think the OIC did a study. They hired Cerulli Associates and went out and found out, like, if you look at a lot of these strategies, you know, in some cases, let's say a buffer strategy is essentially a put-spread collar, right? And so that Cerulli Associates went out and found out, why don't financial advisors buy options, just hedge? In fact, they found that the two biggest reasons why advisors utilize options would be downside protection and income generation, but they don't use them, right? And so they went out and polled over 500 advisors, asked them, hey, you love all the benefits that options can provide, but why don't you use them? And it actually surprised uh, us after reading the paper, and the two biggest reasons why financial advisors don't use options, if you take a guess, number one reason was resoundingly compliance. Compliance was the number one reason why, option paperwork, so on and so forth. The second reason was actually scalability. Why? Because if you buy an ETF, you buy a stock, you put in your portfolio, you can fall asleep for 30 years, it'll continue to do its thing. As a financial advisor, you buy an option 30 days from now, six months from now, a year from now, you have to what? Keep trading it again. If you have 100 clients, 200 clients, 300 clients, how do you scale that solution? This is where, you know, kind of defined outcome, target outcome really came out is that if we package it into a particular fund, now they can consume it in a way that creates that scalability and they don't own an option, they own a what? An ETF, a mutual fund, a UIT, a CIT, any type of wrapper, right? It always, uh, Parallels that kind of thought process. I think what Thaler from the University of Chicago won the Nobel Prize for the nudge. In fact, the study that came out um, of that was he looked at kids in a cafeteria and they had free apples, right? Nobody took them. I think it was like 10% of the kids took the apples. Then he sliced the apples up and put them into bags and the consumption went to 85%. Think about that for a moment. Because why? They made it easier. They wrapped it. The same thing occurs here in, in defined outcome, target outcome, providing that more certainty, those benefits of downside protection, income generation. All we've done is what? 
bag the apple and allow the advisor to be able to consume it in a more easy way. And that's where I think a lot of the solutions as far as defined outcome, target outcome, is taking those same benefits that we see throughout the marketplace today, but put in a wrapper where they can actually consume it. So maybe underneath the wrapper, uh, Charles and, and, and Burke, what, what's going on? What's, what do we actually, when we look at these products on a, at, a, and at a broad base level, what's going on underneath the packaging uh, within these products? Yeah, I, I can start with that. So um, I agree with Jeff, what you were saying about taking structured no payouts and bringing them into the ETF wrapper. That's what this is all about. No one on this stage invented the concept of a defined outcome, but bringing it into the ETF wrapper was the innovation and the scalability, the flexibility, the transparency, being able to slide it into a client's model portfolio allocated across thousands of accounts. That's the benefit of bringing it to the ETF structure. So when Innovator brought the first defined outcome ETF in 2018 to market, we found an immediate uptake from advisors. And our assumption wasn't that it was only going to be structured note users. We thought everybody likes transparency, flexibility, but most importantly, pinpoint accuracy. So Rob, to your question about how it's structured, we use flex options in the ETF. So a typical buffer ETF has four options under the hood. We get to pick when the ETF's options expire, the strike price of those options, and we can pinpoint exactly where that ETF is going to expire at the end of the outcome period. This was novel in the ETF wrapper, but what's so cool about it and interesting is that at the end of this outcome period, let's say it's 12 months, which is a pretty common outcome period for defined outcome ETFs, it rolls within the structure, which is the real benefit of bringing this to the ETF wrapper. Unlike a note, when it becomes due, you have a taxable event, that doesn't happen with the defined outcome ETF. You can hold it in perpetuity, those options will reset, we trade them as a package, we have economies of scale as the issuer, so we get really competitive pricing, which translates to a higher upside cap for you as an investor. A lot of us have buffer ETFs, we have different flavors, 9, 15, 30, 10, there's so many out there at this point, but they have different upside caps. So if you can achieve a higher upside cap using the issuer's scalability, that's gonna benefit your investors as well. So now understanding that you're using flex options within the portfolio, sounds like you're kind of levering up, sounds a little risky. Bruce, how do you, how from a distribution and sales narrative, how do you overcome some of those myths or concerns that this is a, a levered product, that it's a, it's a risk inherent product? Uh, in, in, embedded within the ETF? Uh, well, first off, uh, they're not risky, right? So if you go back and look at flex options, I think flex up, is this loud enough? Yeah. Flex options really go back, what, 30 years, if not more than that, right? So 1994, I think. So exchange traded liquidity, uh, uh, traded on exchange, uh, there's no counterparty risk. Uh, so the OCC, right, uh, co covers, the, covers the buy and the sell side. And then uh, I think the last time I looked that uh, there were 13 million, not notional, but 13 million outstanding flex contracts uh, worth billions of dollars. So if, if you just understand that, right, that there's no risk, there's, there's a risk, but there's, there's very little risk, right? So, but it, from, a, from a distribution standpoint, if you're talking about that, you're never going to get anywhere, right? So again, it's back to what they've said already is let's talk about the wrapper, all right? Let's talk about the vehicle, right? Any board, no, nobody anymore goes to buy a car and look under the hood like we did 25, 30 years ago, right? That's done. So we talk about how does the car get from point A to point B? And so that's what the conversation is with the financial advisor and their client is how do we get from point A to point B? And what's, what's, what's the role? I mean, if, if you look at what we're trying to accomplish here, if you go back to, I think it's 1981, and you go through the end of 2021, and if you look at rolling one-year periods, if you look at the dispersion of returns, 75% of those returns fall within not minus 20 and plus 20. So if you can solve a solution for that where you can provide uh, uh, a downside protection to that 20 side, but you could also participate on the other side on that 20%, here now we can bring a wrapper to the advisor. And so we, we started, when we started in the ETF business, we started back in 2015, we started with our trend pilot series. So our trend pilot series are just simply risk on, risk off strategies using a, a broad based index and applying the 200 day moving average. So we thought that when we got in the buffer business in December of 2021, 
2020, we thought it was a great complement to that because we were already out there talking about advisors and how to talk about risk mitigation, how to appropriate downside protection stories. Mm -hmm. And so now when you add the complement of the, the buffer type strategies, now we can go in and talk to an advisor and say, okay, what are you doing for your clients that are in or near retirement and they can't take they cannot assume the same risk so you know we we can you know start to ask the questions and start to look at the portfolio and you know start to look at you know equities we can start to look at as a replacement for bonds we can look at that as, at as a replacement for alternatives uh, so there, there's a lot of different ways as far as implementation that we can that we can have a conversation about with investors so sales narrative is there, uh, investment thesis is there. Now, in actual practicality, accessing these products, that being that they are exchange traded, they what is what does market quality look like in these products? Given that, again, can folks properly price the underlying flex options? It seems again a little bit like there might be a little disconnect uh, potentially from a market quality perspective. Burke, love love to get your thoughts here. Yeah, I, I love this topic because um, I started my career at Virtu as a trader, so I've kind of seen both sides of it. Um, and I was actually just having lunch with our friends at Susquehanna, who's a great partner to us, and we were talking about just how efficient the market has become for these ETFs. It's a little surprising. I think people look at the basket, they see flex options, and they think, okay, what are these things? They're not printing and ticking during the day. But you have to remember, they're SPY flex options. And SPY is the, most, is the deepest liquidity pool in the world. So when I talk to market makers, um, it's like a Swiss army knife of ways they can hedge the product. They're comfortable with it. They know how it works. There's a delta associated with the ETF. The ETFs itself, if you're an advisor or a retail investor, they trade razor tight. The spreads are super tight. Block trades go up on the MBBO, sometimes within the spread. So we've seen just a, a fabulous evolution of the liquidity ecosystem for these products. And I think at the end of the day, it's because we chose as issuers the most broad-based liquid indices to apply these to. From here, it could scale out, no doubt, but in these early stages, we're tracking SPY, IWM, EFA, Qs. Um, so applying options to that, the liquidity pools are so deep, they allow these ETFs to trade razor tight. And I think just on, on that point, I think now within the marketplace, you have so many more market participants. Uh, you know, Jenica this morning was talking about, you know, market makers and their role, you know, on your panel. And so I know when we started and started to investigate back in 2020, uh, there were only, I think, three or four major you know, market makers that were willing to take the lead to be the lead market makers on these on these type of products. So it, it was really really hard. Uh, but I think now over the last couple of years, there there are so many more market participants, which to your point, just make it just make the product that much more easier easier access, uh, better to trade, and you know more more viability. Yeah, I mean it was even like when we filed the first 40 act fund with Flex Options back in 2012. I think over 10 years ago. There was even less than that, like maybe one or two. It was, it's amazing to see in the last decade how much this has actually evolved in Flex and how many more participants there are. So when we look at now seeing that there is an efficient market uh, for the product, when looking at total cost of ownership and really comparing that to the underlying assets that you're holding within the funds, what, is, what does that look like? How, how, how should we think about that? I feel like I'm talking too much, but I, we, we did model this out, um, and it's interesting. Um, the ETF is more efficient in every manner, so I'll give you a couple reasons why that is. Um, if you want to recreate this payoff, not in the ETF, you would go out, and there are a couple ways you could do it. You could use listed options. You could go out and cross whatever you see on the screens. You could go out and actually buy flex options, um, construct a similar portfolio. So leaving off to the side the fact that you lose the tax efficiency, because those options will become due, we're gonna put that on the side. The actual spreads that you see, um, we modeled 20 basis points as the average ETF spread, which is like four to five cents on a $25 product. Um, you're gonna pay about 70 to 80 basis points of spread if you go and cross the corresponding listed options. So you're gonna pay four times as much spread. That's just spread. Cap is important too, right? Because when you buy the CTF, you have a known buffer and you also have a cap. And you want the highest cap possible in case the market shoots up and you wanna be able to participate as much as you can. Well, the cap, 
you'll also forego if you try to do this yourself. You're going to lose on a 15% buffer. Um, we modeled between 2 to 3% a cap. So a significant loss in cap, um, and you're going to pay wider spreads. Charles, more on a, from, a, from a strategist's uh, perspective, how, do, how should folks think about portfolio construction utilizing these products? We've heard the several different use cases, but from a modeling perspective, really, where's, where's the right fit for these? <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's a great question, and this is something that comes up almost every meeting I have with clients. It's, it's how do I use these in my portfolio? Where do they fit? Are they fixed income alternatives? Are they equity alternatives? And we really look at it as could be placed in any of those buckets, right? So at Allianz, we, we, we view portfolio construction under three lenses, right? There's three core components, which are diversification amongst asset classes, um, portfolio rebalance, and so some have some type of cadence of, of rebalancing. And then the third is the use of derivatives to get some element of risk management into your portfolio, right? So if you think about fixed income in 2022, as rates were increasing and, and valuations were dropping in the fixed income market, this is a good product to slice away from your fixed income exposure to get a little bit of a downside risk protection into your portfolio. On the same note, you can also use this as a, rep, um, to, as a core equity position, right? So you're still getting that equity upside, you still have that equity exposure, but you're taking some protection on the downside. Um, and then recently, you know, something that's come up quite often is cash equitization. You know, earlier this year, money market assets were at all-time highs, and that's where investors were fleeing to safety in, in, after a rough 2022, right? So this is a good transition product to get back into the equity markets, get that equity exposure, not have all of the risk on a full equity, a full long position, but almost dip your toes back into the equity markets with something with uh, risk management. Now, as far as construction goes, you know, we look at, uh, at you know, at 60-40 portfolios, and they were challenged last year. It was one of the worst years um, in recent history for a 60-40, and that's the fundamental building block for portfolio construction. Um, so, you know, when we look at where these, where these products fit in that 60-40, I like to look at uh, slicing a little bit out of equity, a little bit out of fixed income, just to have that protection. And, you know, we recently ran a case study on this. We analyzed a U.S. 60-40 portfolio and a global 60-40 portfolio. Then we reconstructed the portfolio with a 20% allocation to a 20-buffer ETF. And what we found is, you know, the, the upside you give up in 2021 when equity markets are really strong pales in comparison to the, to the protection you get in a market of like 2022, right? So if we look at the 50-30-20 uh, versus 60-40, Last year, that portfolio with that buffer piece outperformed by 229 basis points in the U.S. and then 330 in the global portfolio. Um, and then on the down other side of that in 2021, it underperformed in the U.S. by 130 basis points and it was even with the global portfolio because you have more of a tilt to U.S. equities at that point. But the point is that these are a good buy and hold long-term investment so that it can help you weather those turbulent markets when volatility is high and um, and you're not getting that protection in a, in a fixed income, which is the traditional area to move to. So we think um, there's a lot of different use cases and applications for Buffett ETFs overall. And speaking on the buy and hold uh, scenario, given that the, uh, there is an outcome period, there is a time frame. Jeff, does the investor have to do anything? Do they have to go out and sell the ETF, rebuy uh, around uh, some of those maturity dates? How does, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, that makes the asset allocation a little bit easier. The ETF doesn't expire, so the options always roll. Um, and just to add to the point that um, actually we partnered with SIBO to create indexes, right, the SPRO index. You can actually see how, a, let's say, a 10% buffer. Um, I, I think SIBO has a lot of strategy benchmark indexes. You can see how a 10% buffer on S&P, how it behaved going all the way back to 2005. And so we actually did a, uh, wrote a white paper on this. Um, if you actually look at a 10% buffer rolling, right? Uh, going all the way back to 2005, the standard deviation was almost identical to a 60-40 portfolio. Um, so if, like, if you just think about that from an asset allocation perspective, let's say I have a $100 portfolio, $60 is in equity, $40 is in fixed income. If I take $10 out, I could take six from equity, four from fixed income, put a 10% buffer in, the standard deviation of the portfolio is identical. But what have I done? I've changed the risk management from just asset allocation diversification, but actually what? Introduce hedging that can be perpetually 
inside the portfolio. It, it essentially, because the ETF doesn't expire, it can actually just roll inside the portfolio with the same what? Standard deviation. But why is that important? Is because if you notice, like, like last year, every combination of stocks and bonds lost, right? Every combination, no matter how you mixed it. So the great thing about, uh, let's say if I have S&P and I buy an S&P put, that put is what? Perfectly negatively correlated to S&P, right? There's no question as far as uh, the negative correlation associated, whereas you know, just the traditional 60-40, your hope is what? That when your stocks go down, your bonds go up, and it's a hope, right? And that, in fact, if you look at the correlation, it's never been more positive than it is now. And the other crux of it is volatility. Volatility is not constant. Just because something's low vol today does not, not necessarily mean it's low vol tomorrow. In fact, if you look at the S&P low vol index back in COVID, by June of 2020, S&P was down only 3%. S&P low vol is down almost 14. And by the way, billions of dollars in strategies of people investing in low vol stocks. Why? Because they hope that what? These stocks are low vol today versus tomorrow. Whereas in actual hedging and, and risk management, the buffer uh, funds really allow you to have a perpetual structure that creates that low vol, but without having to re-up and, like I said, creates that scalability. I would just add that you're right. There is a perpetualness to this, but uh, you, you do have to you do have to pay attention. A lot of people call them kind of set it and forget it, uh, but you do have to you know pay attention to the caps, right? So if, if a cap is set at let's just call it 12 percent, and let's just say the the, the index is uh, is running at 10, 11, 12 percent, and then your buffer is let's just call it a, a, a down 10 or down 15. So if you're if you're up near that cap and you have to determine do I want to, uh, where, where are we in the outcome period, right? How much, how much time is left in that outcome period? And how much now downside do I, if I'm, if I'm near the top of the cap and my downside is uh, 10%, so I have, to, I have to take that down to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the buffer level and then down below. So you, you do have to pay attention to them. Uh, so just kind of a, you know, a, a caveat emptor, if you would, just, uh, you know, you, 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 do, you do know how they have to work, uh, which uh, I will then say, and so uh, there's, I know you guys have some fund of funds, and I know we, we have a, a fund of fund, uh, which, which we tell the advisor to, if, if you really want to set it and forget it, use a fund of fund and that fund of fund will be managed by, that's an actively managed fund and that, that, that will be managed by the, the, the sub-advisor uh, and therefore they will do that job for you so you don't have to pay attention. So you can just put it in the portfolio uh, and you know, I just you know, happened to look this morning at our, at our fund of funds and you know, from a return standpoint and a risk standpoint, uh, we, we manage it to a, to a moderate level, uh, you know, a, a downside 15% level uh, but the fund had a, has a year-to-date uh, positive performance of uh, about 6%. So, uh, again, you, you, you do have to pay attention to these. Uh, but, you know, again, looking back at 2022, uh, these did exactly what they were supposed to do. Again, looking back at, you know, for example, the January series that started in January 2022. Uh, and if you look at the outcome of uh, last year, so if you looked at just comparing ours, if you look at our conservative and our moderate model, uh, the conservative was down 5% and the moderate was down 2.6%. So as far as what they were trying to do in portfolios, they did and accomplished exactly what they were trying to do, uh, what the goal and the mission was uh, last year. So maybe on that vein and circling back on the distribution and the, and the sales narrative, uh, curious, Charles, your, your thoughts on differences in the implementation uh, for an individual versus a model portfolio putting and utilizing these types of products. Yeah, so, you know, kind of piggybacking off what Bruce said, um, you know, the, we see these quite a bit show up more and more in the models, right? So. You know, these buffered ETFs can be a satellite position in an equity model, but what we're really seeing a lot more now is these buffered models where they're owning four to 12 different um, buffered defined outcome ETFs. And the, the beauty part of that is exactly as Bruce said, right? You're not constantly looking at your caps. You're not looking at your downside before all these stats, right? To really focus in on when do I want to rotate out of this product into the next product. So it takes away that element of, of 
analysis for advisors and individuals, and they can just buy the, the model and buy, it, buy that as their protection sleeve, right? And it works in the same way as the fund of funds. It's, it's a set it and forget it, as he said, all in one kind of product. So we see uh, model adoption um, increasing quite a bit. Um, and then from the advisor level, you know, if they want to buy the individual month, the individual series, or whether it's a 10 or 20 or, or whatever other cap and buffer you have, um, they can do that, but it's just a little bit more manually intensive, I guess, labor intensive. I would just add that um, I agree with everything everyone said. We released five paper models last year using buffer ETFs, and um, the uptick was very fast, and there was a lot of interest from the RIA community. And I think the benefit of models, we all know that's where the puck is going in ETF land, but um, that versus using a fund of funds, you know, sometimes it's more difficult to justify that two layers of fee um, of a fund of funds versus a model. And then with a model, the advisors can also um, pluck in ETFs that they prefer over the buffer ETFs. So the uptick, um, from our perspective, they weren't even full buffer ETF models, but we were giving advisors ideas about how they could implement the buffer ETFs in a broader asset allocation and hold it for long periods of time. And I think that's key because we found that showing, not telling, has led to the most sales. We point to people, we say, look, the ETS have done as they were supposed to do in 2020. We rebalanced hundreds of times. They've delivered exactly what they were supposed to do to investors. And that's powerful. And then when you, can, when you compare that with a portfolio solutions team or whatever you call it at your ETF issuer firm that says when you implement it, it will do this to your beta and it will do this to your volatility. And you can show them where it fits into their portfolio We've had a lot of success with that, so I think models are definitely where the puck is going. I'm going to I'm going to lead into your next question. Okay. I, I saw your notes. Go for it. <laughs> no, I, I I was just I was just got I was just I was just got to follow up and just say the 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 most important uh, you know uh, part of the equation is when we're sitting down with an advisor is you can go through the greatest story right you can go through the greatest product the greatest idea but if you don't explain where it fits how it fits and why you've really wasted waste, wasted your time so again kind of back to implementation what I said just come from a broad stroke you know looking at the equity space looking at the fixed income space. You know, looking at the uh, looking at the uh, alternative to alternatives. You know, we take the approach of let's just say for you know equities, for example, just keeping it really simple. Three buckets. You want to look at you know you want to look at beta. So uh, you know, do you, do you want to kind of capture returns of some of some sort of group? Uh, do you want alpha? Do you want to outperform uh, in a, in a certain in a certain uh, area of the market? And then the third piece that we say is risk mitigation or downside protection. You should always be allocating a piece of this to your portfolio. I mean, we, we say at minimum, because again, you can, you can give a good idea, but if you don't say how much belongs in the portfolio, that's the other part of the equation. Because uh, then, then advisors will put in, or an investor will put in you know, a risk mitigation strategy, and they'll have you know a million dollar portfolio, and, and they'll buy fifty thousand dollars of 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 a strategy like this, and it does absolutely nothing. So again, so uh, again, that that uh, that uh, implementation of of where it fits, uh, and so you know, we we when we decided to do the buffer defined outcome structured outcome series ETFs two and a half years ago. Uh, again, we, we were already in those conversations with our existing Trend Pilot Series ETF. So it was just, we just thought it was a, a perfect complement to continue to say, okay, what flavor now do you want within this, we'll call it downside buffer risk mitigation strategy. So it's just, it's just that continuation of, again, back to who's the investor, what are their goals, where are they, uh, what, what's, their, what's their retirement time horizon, and uh, are, are, you, are you the advisor doing enough to make sure that you have you know, put, it, put enough protection in their portfolio? Because if you do that, the conversation then goes to the advisor and the advisor uh, accomplished two things for the advisor. Number one, uh, if they get that phone call from the investor, the advisor can then say, uh, don't you remember? that we have 25% of your equities allocated to you know, risk mitigation strategies, oh, that's right, or it eliminates that phone call. And so if you're using 
you know, uh, maybe fund to funds or other type of strategies where you can really set it and forget it. That allows the advisor to take that time that they would have been using as portfolio management and allocate that towards hopefully uh, client experience time. I, I did want to add on that model piece for a second. That just add one of the biggest benefits, like when we launched the first model, uh, Buffer ETF, that the tax efficiency associated with it is huge. Think about it. If you buy a Buffer ETF and you need to sell it and you're going to buy it again, like every time you do that, you have a taxable event when you're selling the ETF. By having it in a fund of funds, we can rotate out the positions through the in-kind process. So just from the tax efficiency alone justifies, even if there is an additional small fee for the fund to fund structure, um, for non-qualified accounts, that tax efficiency through the in-kind mechanism is huge. I think especially if you're actively trying to manage from one buffer ETF to the other, I think these models are, are really really beneficial in doing that, and especially like the way, at least, at least when we construct it, we actually look down to the options. We look at the Greeks. We're looking at the Delta, the, the Vega, the Theta, to really optimize whatever you're trying to accomplish in each of these buffer ETFs. So maybe transitioning the conversation, clearly these products are in demand. They're on an uptick, 25 billion in AUM in the US alone. Uh, looking a little bit to the future, uh, what's next? Innovation, as all of your firms have innovated, uh, some within, literally in their name, um, specifically around, you all have S&P 500 products today. What's next generation product look like? Are there other, does this apply to other asset classes outside of just pure US equity? Uh, this I'd love to open up to just the, the, general, the general group here for some thoughts and some forward looking views. Yeah, I mean, when we launched the first buffer fund, I think back in 2016, um, we didn't think it would be this huge, this whole opportunity, this big. Um, and you know, today, we offer kind of all of these target outcomes across all of our products. I think we uh, are the largest provider across all products for this space. But where I'm most excited, if you think about it, if you look at the world GDP, it's 96 trillion. The derivative market, take a guess, notional value of the entire derivative market, 640 trillion. As you sit here right now, the entire outstanding derivative market is 640 trillion, where the entire world GDP is only 96 trillion. Now, of the 640 trillion, take a guess how much is equity derivatives? 11. 11 trillion. 440 trillion is what? Interest rate derivatives. Think about that for a moment, right? There's a, we're just pecking the surface right now as far as where we can go in providing solutions within ETFs across the derivative market. And when I wake up every day, that's where I think innovation is gonna be, right? You look at that opportunity, it's huge. And that's where, like, if you just analyze the marketplace today and where those solutions are coming from, like I said, 440 trillion is coming from interest rate derivatives. Uh, from our perspective, um, we look at the structured note world when we think about new products and we listen to advisors. We're constantly talking to advisors. Everything we do is advisor driven. Um, like any business, we listen to our customers. And one thing that we repeatedly heard from advisors was they were looking for income. And if you're familiar with buffer ETFs, buffer ETFs give you price appreciation one to one on the upside with a buffer. You do not get any income, you forego the dividend to get a higher cap. So there's no dividend, there's no income with the buffer ETFs. They've still grown immensely. They're a popular risk management tool, but income was missing from that equation. So we launched um, just recently what are called barrier premium income ETFs. And these ETFs are the first ETFs that give you a known level of income over an outcome period with a built-in barrier against losses. So for folks that are looking to diversify that income sleeve, which by the way, most advisors we speak to have, um, this is gonna be a really popular tool for them. And you know, we're looking at other things like principal protection, um, all sorts of instruments that are in the structured note world that should be democratized and be able to put into portfolios with RIAs and independents and wires. We want to take those exposures and bring them to the masses. Yeah, so I'll echo a lot of that. So Allianz being a, an insurance giant, um, you know, risk management is basically what we, we look at and that's how we we're tactically looking at new opportunities in the product strategy space, right? So it's never gonna be something risky, 
per se. It's going to be something that's going to be help mitigate risk. Um, but we're looking at how do we provide solutions to clients, and similar to what Burke said, you know, we listen to our clients. So the income has been the what they've been screaming about for for a while now, and then among some other things. So we we look to what can we put to market that's going to provide solutions for our clients and attract new clients. Granted, it's hard when you have Burke um, launching new products and beating us to the punch every couple of months, but. Uh, and we don't want to just copy everything that Innovator does, obviously, but um, yeah, we, we take a more holistic approach at what solutions are viable, what will best suit our clients, and do, and do good by them on a, on a risk-adjusted level. Well, in, innovation uh, uh, and uh, new entrants to the market, uh, I don't know if anybody saw a couple weeks ago that BlackRock uh, has decided that they're now going to get into the uh, buffered ETF space. So that they, they must see something uh, as far as uh, marketplace and share to gain. So we'll, we'll see how that turns out. Fair enough. And with that, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So if there's any questions uh, in the audience, we'd love to uh, field them for the panelists. I just found that very, those, these products very interesting. I can only imagine that the supplemental disclosure discussion with the SEC disclosure people was very interesting. I guess I can take that first. Um, so the difference between a buffer is you're not fully principally protected. With our buffer ETFs, you have a 15% buffer against losses. If the market finishes anywhere between zero and negative 15, you're buffered. If it finishes negative 16, you're down 1% and so on. So you're not fully principally protected in the buffer ETFs. Um, in terms of risks to the products, there are certainly risks. There are risks with any ETFs. I will not say there are no risks, but the risks um, are minimal relative to other structures, especially when you look at the comparable structures. I look at structured notes. I think that's the obvious comparison versus the ETF. Um, the credit risk that you would experience when you buy that with a single counterparty, I think um, we're at ETP forum, but I think everyone saw what happened with the exchange traded notes that were issued by several banks, shut down a pretty um, dicey process, and you, you don't have that when you have an ETF. You spread that risk. As far as the options in the basket, those are backed by the OCC. Um, so that's a SIFMU. That's an institution that's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So folks would rather take that risk, I think, than a single counterparty risk versus a bank. That's a, that's a key point, and I think we should dig into that right here. So you, you have a 12-month outcome period for a defined outcome ETF. Most people buy it day one, right? You can buy it day one. You have your stated cap and your downside buffer. What happens if you buy it three months in to the 12-month outcome period? It's a question we get really often. Your defined outcome is going to be different, but you still have a defined outcome, which is key if you hold it until the end of that outcome period. We have tons of clients that see an interesting payoff intra-period, and they actually decide to allocate mid-outcome period. And if you hold it until the end of the outcome period, you'll experience the defined outcome. If you sell beforehand, the market will be up or down. We can't guarantee that defined outcome. But the defined outcome is always present whenever you buy it, if you hold it through the end of the period. And if you did look at the volatility, uh a, a buffer ETF will always have less volatility than you know, the price return of S&P, right? So from a risk perspective, if you compare S&P versus a, a buffer ETF, there's no scenario where the vol will actually be higher than actually owning, let's say, S&P from a price return perspective. And, and that will change during the outcome period, right? So the beginning when those options are priced as you move along through the, through the outcome period and get closer towards the end. So you, you will have those options prices adjust accordingly. So again, 
d depending on when you get in or get out, uh, your relative performance to the underlying reference asset could, 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 be, uh, could be different. I think we have time maybe for just one more uh, question, if there is one. Oh. Fantastic. Well, with that, I would love to uh, thank, thank uh, the group of panelists. Thanks for the questions, and thanks for the time.